Maybe years ago now it's been these things happen and then they just seem to just fly. Doesn't it time just flies by? Uh, and so a couple of things before I get to what happened many years ago. One is starting next Sunday, uh, Nick has told me that if you are coming to the building here and instead of coming through that door, though that door will still be open and this door is still open, but he will also have the door that's in front of the school part, the very front of this building, that way open, so that way you can come right on the sidewalk, just in case, you know, there's inclement weather or something strange happening, or there's, you know, three or four foot of snow or whatever, even two inches, just come in, come on the sidewalk there, it'll be clear, and then through the building here, and you'll come out right here at this door. And so, uh, starting next Sunday, you'll have that available. And so, uh, whatever it takes here to get inside the building uh, so that we can worship together. Also, uh, last night, uh, we, had the, we had a really good crowd. It was like Behavioral Health Spanish Congregation Harvest Festival thing that went down. And, uh, of course, very much smaller than like what we've had in the past. It's English speaking, and if you were not Spanish speaking, you wouldn't have really understood what Devin was saying when he would call out numbers and all kinds of stuff. But, um, but it was... It was really well attended and had a pretty good session crowd. Yeah. And so uh, that continued. Uh, you think about all the things that hopefully we will be able to start back up here pretty soon. I miss community chorus, of course, and getting a chance to learn some new songs. Um, and I'm sure you have some things in your minds too that it would be nice. Uh, that, and as Russ has said, the building progresses. Uh, I don't know, there were all kinds of people out there just last week all over the place doing all kinds of things. And so uh, they, are, they are moving on, which is awesome. All right. With that, we're going to talk about living a holy lifestyle this morning. We are following, as you join this, we're following along the book of Deuteronomy. We are roughly tracking some of the things that transpired in the second law given here as Moses gives out three sermons. And we're in the middle now of the book. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 14 here in a moment. And, and sometimes we go back and go, what in the world? What does all of that have to do with us? Well, actually a lot more than we think because it was given to God's people back then. We're God's people today. And so the words back then still, still mean something for us, don't they? And are really spoken to us today. Uh, and as we talked about before, Jesus really enjoyed the book of Deuteronomy and quoted it often. And so, as we've seen already, and so here we go, many years ago, down there in Texas, it's a strange place. It is a whole other country down there, isn't it? And uh, especially one particular little pocket. Those of you that have never lived in Texas or don't know much about Texas, Texas really is composed of two different states. There is Texas and all the things that go to Texas. And all the stuff, and Tex-Mex, and horses, and, and you name it. And then there's Austin, Texas. <laughs> and Austin, Texas is its own little place. And the rest of us always think about that, like, yeah, there's Austin. They don't really count. There's something else, something else that goes on. Many years ago, a librarian there in that town, uh, one of the old librarians called in to a radio program talked all about what made Austin special, and they were actually the first ones, he was the first one that said, you know, Austin is just weird, and we want to keep it that way, and that's, that became their motto, that's their city motto, to keep Austin weird, you're like, that's just weird, <laughs> anyway, that's their motto, other cities have copied them, Port of Oregon, for example, have copied that motto, but Austin was first, and it's just weird. But, okay, you know, they've made our whole identity on that. And they are different from the rest of Texas. And they continue to do that. And so you think for a moment, this concept of being weird or different and uh, what that means. And so I just start thinking through, and this doesn't take the like, this is literally five seconds of internet exposure. And so it doesn't take very long to say, just tell me some names of associations you that exist out there, like the Association for Dressings and Sauces. Like if you really like dressings, salad dressings, you can join a group and you guess we'll talk about some of the dressings all the time. <laughs> the National Pasta Association, that one I could understand. Um, the Association of Cricket Statisticians and Historians. Mm -hmm. 
if you're really into cricket. Um, there's actually, a, of course, a, an association for, for therapeutic humor. Okay. Uh, you just, it goes on and on, doesn't it? There's all kinds of groups out there. And of course, as always, it's fall, so it's football season, so it's easy to do these, right? The fans that go to these football fans, these football games, right? I think that's a Vikings, right? Yeah, okay. Um, it's just different. You just think, what does that guy do for a living? <laughs> that requires a lot of strength. But anyway, you know, I, don't, I still don't quite understand why you wear a piece of cheese on your head. I know Oakland, though. And Oakland, yeah, that's what everybody thinks it's like that in Oakland. That's just what I mean, right? But you just think, ah. And you know, if you're having to argue with the guy that looks like this, like he's arguing with the rep, it's like, you're, he's lost. It's over. It's like, who's going to pay attention to it, right? It's just strange. But it's weird. It's just different, isn't it? I don't even know why they wear the melon the, heads. But anyway, it's, it's strange. But uh, you think about this for a moment. It's like we see it in sports teams. We see it all kinds of places. It really is. It's like proud to be weird. Right? Proud to be different. Proud to be set apart. And so you know where I'm going with this. It's 1 Peter 2, verse 9, right? Um, but you are different. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that belong to God, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are a peculiar group of people. And that's what we're supposed to be. We are supposed to be different. Matter of fact, from the world's point of view, we should look pretty weird. And let me tell you, you do. It's just the way it is, right? It's just the way it works. Yes, you do, Bruce. You see me that look like me? It's weird. It's like, Bruce. And so, all of us, right? This is the way we should be. We should be different. And think about this. What could you be doing this morning? Certainly not dressing up in a suit over here with Bill with the tie on, right? Uh, certainly not sitting in these hard metal chairs and coming to the gym on a Sunday morning. That's just weird. Because most people are not doing this. And so you start going through that concept of what is it that makes us different, unique, set apart, weird compared to the rest of the world. And so we're talking about the power of holiness this morning and what that means. Um, the world needs to see holy people who teach and practice a whole bunch of things that's just weird. Things like you get married to one person and stay faithful to them the rest of their lives. That's just weird since nobody gets married anymore, right? It's just weird. Uh, or that the church, people in the church give their money and time and effort and resources to something else and don't spend it on themselves. That's just different. Uh, people who have addictions and then have overcome it uh, through the Lord, that's just different. Why even bother? Uh, the, the world hopefully looks at us, and if the world's not looking at us and seeing something different, then we're not doing church right. That's the pro, that's the concept. That's what Deuteronomy 14 is all about. So go over there to Deuteronomy 14. That's where we're going to go next. Hebrews 12, 14, of course, another passage on this. God's holiness. What is God's holiness all about? It's his otherworldly power and perfection. Sometimes we associate his holiness with terror, or, or with death, or with fire, or with just trembling before the mountain kind of talk. Because he is set apart, he's different. And his people are different. And if we are not different from the world, we need to start over. Because that's our calling. Our calling is to be called out of this world and placed into something different. And that uniqueness identifies us. And so, lots of things about the old law. And so here we go, Deuteronomy 14 now. There's lots of things in this, in this concept here um, that, that 
Israelites are being called to be different from everybody around them, from the Canaanites. He, he didn't call them to be pagans. He didn't call us to be pagans, like, just like the world. I mean, he's already got plenty of pagans, right? He wants us to be separated out from this world. And so, if you're following along here, it's like he separates. Like, how do we use what we have been given by God? How do we use our tools, our jobs, our work, our relationships, who we are? It's like we need to separate those things from the profane and unite them with God instead. It's that simple. Here's the way to be holy. It's as simple as both as these two phrases right here on the board. You want things to be holy? Separate it from God, from the pagan use and unite it with God. And it becomes holy. So what can be holy? Can the money that you give in the, well, normally I'd say in the plate, but in the box or online on your little internet button there, can that money, is that money holy? Well, yeah. You give it to the Lord, it's holy. But can the money that's in your wallet right now that you didn't give, I've got some money here that I didn't give to the, to the contribution this morning. There it is. Can, is this money holy? Of course it's holy. It's still holy, isn't it? Because if I use this properly, it's holy. I've united it with God. And so we'll talk more about what that means here in a moment. We live our entire lives in holiness, don't we? We're not like, it's not like I go to, it's not like the minister has a sacred work and the rest of you have profane works. No, your work is just as sacred as my work when you're a school teacher or you're an engineer or you're working at whatever company. It can be just as holy because you're uniting it with God and separating it out from the way the world would see it. You're feeding your family properly. You're doing what's right. You're giving to the Lord. And on and on the list goes. And so, so when we think about this holiness business, uh, it's important, right? Exodus 22, 20. Uh, there, of course, God's like, you know, if you worship any other gods, I'm basically going to death the penalty. So God's a holy God. And so Leviticus 10. We've got some sons of Aaron, and they're like, they use strange fire. And what does God say? Ah, that's not quite right, because I'm holy. And so bad things happen. Holiness is heavy, in other words. God is sacred, and he will not be mocked. And so this concept of being sacred, being the oddballs, being the separated out, things like we believe in telling the truth, like, that's such a strange concept in the day. Like today, it's like it's becoming much more Hindu in, in its view of lying, right? The Hindus, of course, believe that lying is good if it provides for your family. And so they see it as a virtue to lie. And you're like, wow, that doesn't make much sense. Yeah, if we think differently than that, we're being set apart from the world now because the world just considers it all good to lie, right? To protect people, to get ahead, or to do whatever. Uh, in marriage and helping others. All of that's just so different. So here we go. We are on the four. Let me get over there in the text too. I want to go ahead and read the, some of these chapters like we're doing. Uh, we are on the four. And so here's, here's our concepts now as we look at this. It's basically about cutting yourselves, eating shrimp, and how much you get. That's the three sub-topics of this chapter. So if you really want a synopsis, if you're doing your chapter locations, which I highly recommend, here's the way to remember this chapter. It's about not cutting yourselves, not eating shrimp, and how much money you, have, you actually get for four. That basically summarizes the three different sections of the chapter. We're going to read it because when's the last time you talked about cutting yourself, eating shrimp, or how much money you get? And so here we go. It is chapter 14. And let's get started with it right now. You are a holy people, a different people. You are a children of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave your forehead bald for the sake of the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. He has chosen you to be his people, prized above all others on the face of the earth. So that's the very first section. Very short, the Canaanites, of course, practice cutting themselves when they worship their gods until uh, they glad. And God's like... Don't be like them. It's that simple. Notice how it is set up here? He's like, if the pagans are doing it, it's probably not so good to do. So don't do it. Don't be like them. They worship their idols by cutting themselves. Don't be like them. So you see how he's setting it up? 
He's like, you're a holy people, you've been set apart, don't you like the world? If the world's doing it, it's probably not very good for you anyway. And then we have this long section on kosher eating. And so, when's the last time you thought about kosher eating? Probably not that often. So here we go, we'll read this text very quickly. You must not eat any forbidden thing. These are the animals that you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the ibex, the gazelle, the deer, the wild goat, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. But you may not eat any animal that has hooves divided into two parts. You may eat any animal that has two parts and that chews the cup. So he starts setting up some rules of eating. And so I'm going to, you know, you're a holy people, don't be like the pagans. And here we go on kosher eating. And so the first one, land animals, they must have split hooves and they must chew the cud. If they don't do both, you can't eat them. If they only do one or the other, they're off limits. Like pigs, for example. Right? However, you may not eat the following animals among those that chew the cud or those that have divided hooves. The camel, the hare, and the rock badger. Although they chew the cud, they do not have divided hooves and are therefore literally impure to you. Also, the pig is richly impure to you. Though it is divided hooves, it is not chewed cut. So you can see how it goes back and forth. You may not eat their meat or even touch their remains. So what in the world is he doing here? He's doing something very simple. The diet was meant to separate them from the world. How often do Orthodox Jews think about being different from the world? At least three times a day. They think about being different from the world. Because when they sit down, and I'm in front of the plate, and I go, oh, she'll just make her lasagna, it's going to be awesome. They don't touch it. Because it's, well, we'll get to it in a moment. It's mixing cheese and meat together. And that's a no-no. And so, uh, something as simple as that. But back to this first one. So notice it's the idealized form. As we read all of these, it's, it's, it's almost like the spiritual form. It's like the idealized form of whatever animal we've got under discussion. It's like, nope, it's got to be both. It can't be one or the other, or half an animal that does this. It's got to be, it's got to be the whole thing. He goes to the, the next one, the water creatures. These you may eat from among water creatures. Anything with fins and scales you may eat. But whatever does not have fins and scales you may not eat, it is richly impure to you. Things like catfish, they're right? But, you know, rainbow trout, go ahead, have at it, right? And so, you've got to pay attention to your fish, because do they have scales, do they have fins, do they have one or the other? If they don't have both, they're out. And so, shrimp are out, right? And so, um, it's just the way it works. It's separating you out from everyone else. Verse 11, the birds, all ritually clean birds you may eat. These are the ones you may not eat. The eagle, the vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the black kite. Etc. 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 Every raven, ostrich, every owl, the seagull, the falcon, the little owl, the big owl, every owl in between, basically. Don't be eating them. It's all the different animal birds that eat other animals, and that therefore they eat blood, and so they're not pure, and so don't be eating them. And especially the last one. Especially the bat. If you're going around eating bats, you really should be eating bats. <laughs> I think that's it. But let's put it up on the board. There we go. They must have two legs. And they must be in the air. They must be able to fly. And they cannot eat things like blood. So no blood. No birds that eat blood. You know, like, you know, scavenger birds. You know, the eagle, for example, is actually a pretty big scavenger bird. So it eats you know, bird. It eats other things. Blood. And so uh, you don't eat those things. Verse 19, and any swarming winged thing is impure to you, that may not, those things may not be. So no bugs. Stay off the bugs. There's only one bug you can really eat in all of kosher eating. What was it? Locusts. Somebody said it right here. Paul, oh, good job. Locusts. Locusts are clean and you can have at it. Um, boil them, fry them, do whatever. But there are all the other bugs are off limits. No crickets or ants or anything else. And so... Don't be eating the bugs. The locusts, though, are kind of pure. They fly, they, they don't eat blood, you know, so they fall within the kind of the good bird camp. You may eat any clean winged creature. You may not eat any corpse, though you may give it to the resident foreigner who is living in your village. He may eat it, or you may sell it to the foreigner. But you don't know how that whatever critter died. 
So no roadkill, nothing like that, right? <laughs> and so, you know, they just recently did pass a law in Tennessee that you can't eat roadkill. That really was a law that just passed. That you can't eat roadkill. So you have to drag it across the border now. But anyway. <laughs> 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 Oh, <laughs> uh, nothing struggled or found dead, right? You can't eat it. And so lots of different rules. No animals, and this is a baby, no animals cook in their, in their mother's milk. So Orthodox Jews even today don't mix dairy and meat together. So goodbye, casseroles. That's actually a blank on your page, write it down. <laughs> goodbye, casseroles, right? Because think about all casseroles we eat, where there's meat and cheese. And they don't mix. And so you get with some Orthodox Jews, and if you're not careful, you'll order stuff like that. And then they are looking at you like that look of like, how could you? But anyway, um, so you know, do you have a sense with all of that that it's like you're the oddball. Can you imagine? It's like these rules are more than just, just like, okay, don't eat this, do eat that. Yeah, there's some safety stuff and some <laughs> cooking stuff that God had some wisdom of, like certain meats and all of that. But really, what is he doing? He's separating them out from the world. And he's reminding them at least three times a day, you are different than the world. And so that's important, isn't it? See, there's a point to that. Now, I'm not going to, I mean, I had bacon and cheese together yesterday. Cheese on and bacon together, right? It was good. <laughs> so I'm not used, so God's not reminding me about that. He wants me to remind myself in different ways. But when I read this text, it is a, a reminder, isn't it? Okay, wait a minute. We are to be holy. We are different people. We are not like the world. Let's read the rest of it now. And we'll be finished. And so, uh, this last little bit here, the last section now, 22. Yep, we have the time. Let's do it. Um, you must be certain to tithe all the produce of your seed that comes from the field year after year. In the presence of the Lord your God, you must eat from the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your olive oil, the firstborn of your herds and flocks, and the place he chooses to locate his name, so that you may learn that the Lord your God is holy to revere the Lord. When he blesses you at the place where he chooses to locate his name, is this that it's okay? Convert your animals or grain or whatever into money, secure the money, travel to where the Lord's at, and then buy it again. He doesn't want to make this to be a burden. He wants it to be a joyful thing, right? It's a very joyful thing. How joyful is it? Listen to these words. Then you may spend the money however you wish for cattle, sheep, wine, beer, or whatever you desire. You and your household may eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and enjoy it. It wasn't just I'm offering up this cow to the Lord. I also participated in it. I got to eat this cow. I, I participated in the feast, right? That's the way those, those sacrifices work. You would bring it, and the priest would get some, and the, some of it would be burnt for the Lord, and then we'd have a big feast, and we would eat of this. that sound familiar? Like, you ever heard anybody? It's like, oh, you know. I, when I hear that, I know I've just heard, of a, I've heard from a person who doesn't know anything about God's Word. I'll hear people say it, oh, you know, you've got to be careful with the Lord's money that's in the contribution plate because, we, I don't know, that really shouldn't benefit us. And you're like, well, it did in the Old Testament. Why wouldn't it in the New? I mean, that's the whole point. He's like, enjoy it. It's like, it's a part of what's going on. As for the Levites in your villages, you must not ignore them, for they have no allotment or inheritance. At the end of every three years, you must bring all the tithe of your produce in that very year, and you must store it up in your villages. Then the Levites, the resident foreigners, the orphans, and the widows of your villages may come and eat their fills, and the Lord your God may bless you in all the work you do. That is God's holiness. And that we are also to be a people of holiness. On the back page now, here we go. We're talking about giving it to the Lord. So just a couple of little side notes here. I've got to come up here so I can see it. Kosher. 
What does Jesus say? This little side point about animals, right? Mark 7, 15 through 19, what does Jesus say? You can eat it all. There's nothing unclean when it comes to food, right? It all comes from the Lord. So what's the point Jesus is trying to make? Well, he makes the point that 20 through 23 is what comes out of you, not what goes in you that makes you holy. And so that's where we're going to spend the rest of this lesson. We're going to look at what is it that's coming out of us that makes us holy. And so on the back page of your sheet here, I've got about seven little blanks. But at the very top, just a reminder about giving to the Lord and down below the principles of tithing. And so just a few things about this when it comes to our money. Um, notice the four protected camps. And so I've got four blanks up there. I've got them on the front page too, so I've got it twice. But notice the four protected camps that God really says, like, like, if you have limited resources, you better make sure you're giving to these four camps, right? What are they? The ministers, the fatherless, the widows, and the immigrants. End of the story. I mean, he uses point blank those four words. It's like, here's the four camps that God considers sacred, protected entities. The foreigner who now lives in your midst, the widow, the fatherless, that the orphans, and the ministers. Because they minister to you with God's word. And so it's that simple. And so I am a huge fan of, of making sure those four camps are protected. And I bet you are too. And that makes us different, doesn't it? And so valuable lessons. I could start at any one of those, right? There are valuable lessons in each other. If you struggle with any one of those four groups, you've got an issue with the Lord and His holiness. And what he does with his money. Because this is what the Lord believes money should be spent on. And so take your pick, right? Uh, and so just a little side point there of do we want to make sure we're treating our ministers well? Yes. And I learned that lesson way back when I was working at Harper Fields. I can still see those others. And they brought Shill and I in, and we were a part of the mission, you know, the Families that were being supported by missions and the church and the elders, we didn't really meet with the elders other than just this, this major meeting we had where they basically said, we're here for you and you guys are being supported by us and the first thing we're going to do is make sure you're saving for retirement and you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this. So have, tell us what you're doing monetarily. And we're like, wow, that's a different setup for elders, right? Because most of the time what I hear from elders across the brotherhood, sad to say, and I'm going to say it because these people need to repent in some of these churches. I'm telling you. Elders across America need to repent. You know why the church is shrinking? Because of elders like that who would look at Sheila and I and go, how much can you possibly get squeezed by on in your life? How, what little amount can you live on because you're sacrificing for the Lord? Literally, those were the words. And you're like, you guys have a clue. Right? And so, because God protects these four camps. And if we're not taking care of these four, we've got issues with the Lord. It's that simple. And so do we? Yeah. We're running a children's home. We are wanting to make sure we reach out to immigrants. We take care of our ministers, don't we? And so we do an awesome job with this, but we want to keep doing it, don't we? That sets us apart. That makes us holy. Because the world looks at these four camps and goes, what? Yeah. They're not really that important. They should have taken care of themselves. Or they should do whatever. And so, just a little preaching point here. But, wow, it's so black and white in the text. If you said it in the Old Testament and says it in the New Testament, we probably should be doing that, shouldn't we? And so, let's not stop, right? And we won't worry about other churches or what they're not doing. We'll just make sure to do it here. Okay, let's look at the be holy and all you do. So just some hints. So here's the way you think about this. How do you look different from the world? Like, well, we've already mentioned one. You give to things that the rest of the world doesn't care about. You give to the church, which is very strange and very rare nowadays, right? And so let's just make this little list here real quick. Because God is holy, we are to be holy in all we do. Without holiness, we cannot see God. How can you be holy in these in these areas of your life? And so... Uh, couple little quick questions here as we look at these seven. It's how can I separate 
these things from the ordinary, and how can I unite it with God? That was our first two questions that we've already looked at. So now I want to tear apart for a moment the last 30 seconds here we go to this sermon and remind you, this is what you and I have to do in our lives. If you and I are holy, then I need to make sure that my relationship with God is different. Do I love God? Am I prayerful? Am I committed to His church and His people? Am I trusting? Am I faithful? So that sets us apart. I'm trying to identify things that where we go, what does the world do? The world doesn't believe in prayer. The world doesn't commit themselves to a group of, of God's people. The world doesn't focus on God and what He wants. And so there's this whole entire, okay, what's our spirituality? See, that makes me different from the world. When you go to the King Supers this morning and they're like, what in the world are you doing wearing a tie? Do you have a wedding you're going to? And you go, no, actually I don't. I'm going to church. And they're like, what? See, that makes you different. Weird, that the fact that you should be in bed sleep right after partying and all that stuff. Number two, the body and the mind. It's like, are you disciplined? Are you not indulgent? Are you sexually pure? Are you addiction free? See, all those things separate us out. From the world. Jill and I are driving out, you know, a few days ago, and driving by one of those places that sells the marijuana, and there goes in a, you know, middle-aged woman with her small boy, dragging him in there. And you're like, well, of course, because there's nothing wrong with it, right? That's just the world. That's just they, it's what they do. And you're like, well, I didn't know they let children in there. I guess they do. And so, uh, but you're like, wow, are we different than that? We People would say we're weird because we don't do that. And so, what about our body and mind? See, how do we separate? When we think about different areas of our lives, how do we look holy? Like our spouse and family issues. And can we look different from the world here? Of course we can. Just being married makes us look different. Wife loving, husband respected, faithful, submissive, unselfish, all those kind of thoughts, right? Having children. I mean, that's more and more going to be separating us out, right? I mean, you've got a family. You honor, we honor families. It's like so many things here, right? That can separate us and make us look different. Number four, money. What we do with our money. Are we hardworking, not lazy? Are we content with what God's given us? Do we live below our means? Are we generous? Just think about this. We'll get, we'll get to the bottom here. Well, now's a good time to do it. It's the principles of tithing. It's down below. Um, the Israelites gave about 30% annually. That was kind of the baseline. Tithing itself was 10% of stuff, but if you top, if you total up everything they gave, it's about 30%. Um, and that, of course, made them different from the world. Um, and so when you look at the Bible, obviously, most of the time, that was the figure that they kind of like, okay, here's your beginning point in life. A 10% of your income. And does that make us different? Yes. I think overall in America, it's like 2%, 2.5%, somewhere between 2 and 2.5% 2 uh, is given to charities and churches and everything combined. <coughs> so that's how much income from people across America on average. And hopefully we as Christians are different than that. Uh, we believe in what we give to and we believe it's eternally significant. And so you can see how that's different and sets us apart. You, all you have to do is say that. You just say, I give to a church, and people are like, you do what with your money? Why would you do that? And so that makes us different. Uh, number five, what we do with our friends and neighbors. Okay. Do we show justice, mercy, pro-life, racial reconciler, disciple maker? Those are all things that make us different, don't they? Number six, our, how we deal with society. Do we put God's kingdom first before our culture? Or before this, wherever place we're at? And finally, the last one, even what we do with our leisure and entertainment, right, can set us apart. Do we, what kind of movies do we look at? What kind of hobbies do we have? Do we practice some different ways of living in the rest of the world? And so, I've given you seven, there's probably other camps, other areas in your life that, right, in the Old Testament, if you ate a casserole, you're not you're being just like a pagan. But today, it's these things, isn't it? Those things separate us out. 
Does the Lord still want us to be separated out? Yes. Does he expect us to eat certain foods? No. It's not about the food. It's about more than that, isn't it? Like giving 10% or more is, is a unique, different perspective. And definitely people would say that's just plain weird to do that. This isn't a sermon about money, of course. It's a sermon about being holy. So are you proud of the holiness of God and the holiness of His people? You know, oh, I know, 55, 55, right? <laughs> so you think, you know, I've been around a little while, and man, I have had some peculiar thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure you have too. And maybe you're going, Edward, you're one of them. I would be proud to say that, right? I mean, we are the rebels. We are the ones that are different from a world that, isn't it amazing? The more the world talks about being unique and different, the more they all look the same. Isn't that amazing? It's like how, how it all just, you gotta think just like that, you gotta act just like that, you gotta think just like that. It's like everything is like rote, like computerized sameness. And we are the different people. We are peculiar people. We are a people that, that I'm telling you, as simple as this, it's this simple. We are a people who give second chances. Because the world doesn't. One and done. Do it wrong, you should be let go. I find that hugely satisfying and hugely a part of us being a peculiar people. We have had people at Hope Light point blank tell us as an organization, I don't think I can work with you guys you give your employees second chances. They actually wrote it on their exit form. Think about that. What kind of place do you want to work at? Do you want your boss to go, oh, you didn't do it the exact way I said it. Get out. Would that be terrible? Ah, oh, I can't imagine. And so I'm like, well, you can write that down, but we're not changing. We're a third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance kind of place. So I'm this is who we are with the church. It's like, can you imagine God coming to us and saying, I told you to be holy. And you were. So get out. <laughs> That's what we're all about. Are people, does that make us different? Yeah, it does. And, and so I guess the, the final conclusion of this lesson is just, you guys keep being weird. It'll be good. <laughs> all right? I mean, there's no other way around it. Keep being different. Keep being set apart. It'll make a difference in our city and in our community and in our towns and in our area in Colorado and the rest of the world if we will do these different things. Yeah, people are always going to say things. People are going to say, what a waste. You support missionaries in Vienna? What a waste. What were you thinking? We just have to be different. Or we're building a church building. Why would you do that? Well, we're just going to be different. Why would you live your life a certain way? Why would you give up on certain things? Why would you stay with that spouse who doesn't, who treats you so poorly? Because we're different. That's what it's all about. And so, probably not going to. You could, you could eat shrimp. Go ahead. Right? It's probably not. It's not about shrimp. Okay? It's about being whole. And so, thanks for being uh, who you are. And uh, I will. Uh, on behalf of the ministers, and the ministers can, can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I know them well enough and they've expressed this well enough in so many different meetings. They really like working at Home and Church Christ. We have a good group of ministers, and they feel well supported. So that's a part of that mission, isn't it? And so um, as they give back and we all rejoice together. I didn't, I didn't say that very much, but let me just, in closing here, kind of hit that one more time. 
that concept in the book of, of Deuteronomy that we just read, where they gave to the Lord, and then the Lord gave it right back to them and shared it together. How many fellowship meals have we had together that we've enjoyed? Where it was a joy to see the child, to see the parent, to see the grandmother, to see what kind of joy was involved in those operations every time we do something together as a church. That's what God wants. He expects. He, he desires us to do that. And so, as we think about our giving and what we do in our lives and how we eat and how we talk and on and on that list goes of things up there, right? Um, the church should be different, right? Holy, set apart, not like this world. Let's continue to do that. Let's end and sing.